Good morning. Welcome to worship at Salem United Methodist Church. My name is Kurt Meter. I'll be liturgist for the service this morning. And our call to worship. Brokenness floods our world, dividing us against each other. Fear grips us and we need to know what to do. Lord, we come before you today seeking your guiding love. Pour out your spirit on us that we may truly serve you. Amen. Our opening hymn of praise is O God Beyond All Praising. Merciful God, we boldly pray to you, confident that you will not reject us. In spite of our human failings, your love continues to draw us together. Be with us today as we rejoice in the power of your love. Sing with us today as we proclaim the good news of your grace. Dance with us today as we celebrate the unity we share in Christ. How good it is to worship you together. Amen. Our Psalter lesson this morning is Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, 
I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Amen. Hi friends, welcome back again. Got my old hand over here, my high five. And I want to go one finger further. So it's this middle finger, okay? We've talked about thanks, thanksgiving. We've talked about asking God in prayer. We've talked about praising him, praising him at all times. Oh, that's for next time. That's read. I'll let you in on a little secret. That's read. We're going to do something with reading next time. Today is that middle finger, and it is sorry. Hmm. What does it mean to be sorry? Have you ever been sorry? I know I have. There's been some times when I haven't made some good choices and I've been sorry, whether it was to my family or my friends or my coworkers or God. Sometimes I've done some things that weren't according to his plan for me and I felt that sadness. I felt kind of like my heart was crying inside. I felt kind of bad. And sometimes I knew what to do and sometimes I didn't. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. We want to take our Thanksgiving to our Thanksgiving to our forgiving. Our forgiving. What does it mean when we forgive someone? Hmm. What does it mean when we forgive someone? When we say, I'm sorry, right? I'm sorry. S-O-R-R-Y. And I just wrote a couple little words here next to those letters. I think it means showing our remorse, our sorrow. It restores you and me. So when we show that we are sorry, when we talk to each other, when we talk to God, when we know that we've made a mistake and we've done something that wasn't very nice or very kind, we can say, I'm sorry. I hope that the person that you're saying you're sorry to will say, let's talk about it. I understand. This is how I felt. I hear how you feel. And let's talk about it because you matter to me. You're my friend or you're my daughter or my son or whatever you might be, whatever that friendship is, okay, is I understand that you're sorry and I want to forgive you. I want to be forgiving because that's the way I can give new life if I forgive. Because if I keep all that sadness in my heart because you hurt me, or you keep it because I hurt you, we won't know the joy of Jesus. And we always need to seek the joy of Jesus. So it's a good thing because that love and mercy of God that forgives us is something that he planted in the soil of our heart so that we can forgive each other. Because I know myself, I've made some pretty big mistakes, some pretty big oopses, and I bet you you have too. Sometimes you feel bad for a long time. And then, by God's mercy and his love, he kind of knocks like that knock-knock joke last week. He knocks on our hearts and says, I'm here for you. Don't feel like that anymore, because that keeps us away from each other. If we're not close to God, it's going to be really hard for us to be close to each other. So we don't want to do that. And I brought my phone back again today because I was thinking of a couple things. Sometimes when you're sending somebody a text message, you might put at the very end of it, LOL. Do you know what that means? L-O-L. Hmm. You're right. It means laugh out loud. Something must have been pretty funny. What about BTW? Yep. By the way, hey, by the way, or CYL, I like that one, see you later, alligator, or BRB, hmm, be right back. There's a couple other ones here that I thought maybe you could add to your next text message if you have to say you're sorry to someone and you maybe want to break the ice and text them a message and say, hey, can we talk? I need to talk to you. PFM. Y-F-Y, or I-F-Y, and I-F-M. Do you have any idea what they mean? Hmm. I bet you you don't because I kind of just made those up. The P-F-M 
could mean pray for me, or it could be please forgive me. I did something wrong and I need your forgiveness. I, F, Y, I forgive you. God forgives me and I forgive you. And I, F, M, and I think this is a really hard one sometimes for us, I forgive me. Sometimes it's hard to just forgive yourself when you do something kind of silly or not so nice or not so kind. You kind of hold it in there and then everything you do after that kind of is the same kind of way. You're just missing that joy and you're just kind of kind of caught in that. It's kind of like a windstorm. You're kind of caught in that and you just can't forgive yourself. So don't forget, friends, God forgives you and he loves you. Give it a try. The next time you feel a little bitter or a little sad, maybe just right now, or maybe even at somebody from a way long time ago, open those doors to that heart again. Don't forget to always read the Bible. They always have good, good ideas for you in there too. And forgive yourself. Forgive other people and experience God's love in a new and amazing way. So until next time, friends, be the giving for the living when you forgive. Okay? See you next time. Don't forget those attachments. They're there for you too. Bye-bye. that it was good. You have given us all we need. Indeed, you are good. Yet at times we forget the goodness that is you, Lord, and we turn away. We all give in to temptation and fall away from who and what you would have us to be. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to live more fully in your goodness. Creating God, we come today with many things on our hearts people who need a touch of healing, situations that need your guidance, relationships that need your mending touch. This all weighs on our hearts. Lord, hear our prayers as we offer them to you now.
God of all, we thank you for your healing touch. We thank you for your comfort. We thank you for your generous blessings. We thank you for being good. Continue to help us grow closer to you as we journey through this life. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have two scripture readings this morning. The first is from the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. And the second scripture reading this morning is from the book of James in the New Testament, chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. No one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then... When that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Adam and Eve sinned by disobeying the word of God. Through them, sin came into the world, and sin has since been prevalent throughout the world. Who made Adam and Eve sin? Of course, Satan. Satan does not want people to enjoy the blessings of God, so he tempted our ancestors to give way to sin. And then somehow, sinful nature crept into their hearts. Since then, mankind in general have sinned. Living away from God and from His blessings. However, 
there has always been some godly line of believers in God. From this godly line, the Savior Jesus Christ was born. Through him, all the people of the world would be blessed. Since Adam and Eve were defeated by Satan in their submission to temptation of sin, Jesus Christ was to defeat Satan in his conquest of temptation of sin to reverse the course of sin and uh, curse and death on the part of mankind. Now, how did Satan defeat Adam and Eve? By tempting them to disbelieve in the word of God. Satan, in the form of a serpent, said to Eve, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? Eve replied, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. Serpent was Satan said to Eve, You will not surely die even if you eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. Of course, these words of Satan were a lie. Satan is a liar, and as such, he has lied about the word of God. With such lie about the word of God, Satan defeated Adam and Eve. And Satan has since deceived the people of the world to this very day. So many people today do not believe in the word of God anymore, including the historicity of Adam and Eve. I mean, they do not believe in the fall of Adam and Eve. Consequently, they do not believe in the original sin. Furthermore, they do not believe in the redemptive death of Christ on the cross for the sinful mankind. Now, let's compare Adam and Christ. Adam was defeated by Satan because of his lack of faith in the word of God. But Jesus defeated Satan with the word of God. We can find this from the account of Jesus' temptation in Matthew chapter 4. For instance, Satan offered Jesus the glory of the whole world. If only Jesus worshipped him. But Jesus said to Satan, It is written, Worship the Lord, your God, and serve him only. So the first principle of overcoming Satan's temptation is to know the word of God and believe in the word of God and use the word of God. I'm going to point out one more principle this morning. 
That principle is to get rid of evil desire by doing or thinking of something good. James 1 verses 14 and 15 says, quote, Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Listen, from our own experiences and from these verses as well, we learn that our own small evil desire, if it is not cut off immediately, grows strong enough to give birth to evil action. So we must take seriously even the smallest of sins because sin always results in death of some kind. A teenage girl was involved with afternoon soap operas which developed an inordinate amount of sexual curiosity in her. After numerous one-night stands and a short marriage that ended in catastrophe, she found her way to a certain church and told the pastor there her story. It was unthinkable that someone with her background could ever live the way she found herself living. She was a mother, teenager, at home, church, and school, but by her own admission. The afternoon soap operas led her into sin that she never imagined possible. A fine Christian man began stopping at a local bar after work to spend some time with his friends. He had never had any desire to drink, but he figured one beer wouldn't hurt anything. He even convinced himself that by drinking one beer, he would be able to relate to his friends better and maybe get an opportunity to share Christ with them. Before long, one beer became two, then three. Soon, he was going home drunk, and eventually he lost his wife and kids. He said, in my heart, I knew it was wrong. But I figured every man has his vice. Did he wish he could go back and deal with his drinking problem when it was just one beer every once in a while? You bet he did. But the damage had been done. So try not to allow even a small sin into your life. One sin opens the door for other sins that soon blossom into major problems. But trying to avoid sins is not sufficient safeguards against sins. 
Do you know what Confucianism is? Confucianism is the principles of conduct based on the teachings of a Chinese named Confucius. He once said something like this. If you do not do anything for three days, you are more likely to be susceptible to temptation of some kind. So Confucius recommended people to do something good instead of idling away their time. He must have identified human psychological makeup. His teaching can also apply to Christian life. I mean, if you do not do anything except trying to avoid sins, you are more likely to be susceptible to temptation of some kind. All people know right from wrong because of God-given conscience in their heart. But many people choose wrong instead of right because we human beings are corrupt through and through as a result of Adam's sin. One of the ways to prevent this is to constantly pursue good. So constantly do something good in compliance with the, the teachings of the Bible. The other day, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal about health. It is with uh, a recent medical research into how you can live long after retirement. According to the research, those who work voluntarily after retirement live longer than those who do not work at all. And also, those who do not retire and are engaged in a job that gives, not stress of course, but joy to them, live longer. So the finding of the research recommends people to be engaged in something enjoyable if they want to live long. This finding can also apply to Christian life. I mean, you should not only try to avoid sins, but also constantly pursue good. Constantly do something good in compliance with the teachings of the Bible. That way, you can not only defeat sins, but also live happily and long in the Lord. During my past ministries, I have seen many Christians fall away because they slowed down in the race of faith. If you do not keep right on running the race of faith, you will little by little lose your faith and eventually lag behind or even backslide. As for me, I have been doing the things of God I like to do. And I will continue to do the things of God passionately to my last breath. 
So I think I will live happily and long in the Lord. I like the philosophy of the Apostle Paul expressed in Philippians chapter 3. Quote, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called you heavenward in Christ Jesus. Keep right on doing the things of God. Not reluctantly, but passionately. And God will bless you with joy in life and health and above all, eternal life, eternal rewards in heaven. Amen. I'd like to express these words at our time of offering during the service. Out of gratitude for the many blessings we receive and out of appreciation for all each of you do to support our ministry at Salem Church, we want to take a moment to thank God for all of these gifts and so much more. Would you pray with me? God of abundance and joy, we thank you for the many blessings you have poured on our lives. Receive all of our offerings and gifts, lovingly given, and bless them in your service. Amen.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.